Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Soil Network. I'm Lindsay Smith with Real Agriculture, and today we are talking soil with Jen Dolman. Welcome here, Jen. Thanks very much for coming, Lindsay. All right, so huge topic, soil health, the quality of our soil, managing our soils. You're part of the Ontario Soil Network, and on your farm today, we want to talk about resiliency. So how? walk me through your farm, and then let's talk about how you're turning your soil into resilient soil. So we farm in Renfrew County, which is its own creature. Uh, it's a beautiful area to live, a little tricky to farm in. There's an African proverb that says, smooth seas don't make for skilled sailors. So we're on a tight white admast in clay, uh, which I once upon a time thought was pure clay, but it's actually a silty clay. So I think if we needed to, we could make pots out of our ground. So since I graduated from university in 2003, this area has had a real resurgence of like corn and soybeans and cash crops when we had been very much cattle and dairy and so more of an alfalfa based system. And so I've been seeing as an agronomist in the area as people are moving to more tillage, moving away from more cereals, moving away from the alfalfa, things are really tightening up. And so for our farm, especially like We've been doing no-till since the late 90s. My dad was one of the first people to get a no-till drill. We couldn't quite get the corn no-till though. It hadn't come ahead. And so the ground was really, really tight and very unforgiving. In 2012, we had a phase three drought and it was devastating. Um, the, we couldn't pay the bills if it wasn't for crop insurance. We actually offered some of our corn to our neighbors for free and they wouldn't take it for forage because, and that was when they needed feed because it was gonna cost them too much to harvest. And so we're like, something needs to change. Right, so what's a phase three drought? Phase three drought means like our lo water levels were so low that I don't think it gets any worse. Like the river was almost dry. Wow. We didn't have any rain from mid-May until mid-August. Right. And by then the crops had like, they literally had died. So yeah. it was it was pretty brutal. So now, now we are, you know, seven years out from there. Yeah. And that was sort of the impetus. So what has changed in your crop rotation in these seven seasons so far? So it, we had been doing a lot of changes already with resiliency and trying to get that. So it's not like it was like a light switch. It's just in that year, we could see evidence where we'd had better soil health. We had a little more resiliency. And so nothing really worked that year. But both this year and last year, we had bad summer droughts. And we've been very much focusing on trying to, trying to manage having as much residue as possible, trying to make sure we've got the root structure there and just minimize traffic. And it's really hard, but we only work the ground when it's fit. So that means that we are not the people cropping when all of our neighbors are. And it takes a lot of self-esteem to do that. A and lot of I, patience, I would imagine. Actually, the best thing to do is just leave. Right. Like we just leave okay. like on the Sundays when everybody else is cropping and we know the field's not fit. We just take the kids to a museum That's or we go for a okay. hike because <laughs> you'll go crazy. It's really hard being a, like this, the crazy person in the neighborhood. Right. Um, but at the same time, we don't have alfalfa in our rotation the way a lot of our neighbors do. So therefore, we need to be doing a little extra. So we're also trying because I'd love to have livestock and you probably heard my little calf in the background. It's only one calf. Um, because of that, we don't want to be doing a lot of thawed water bowls over the winter time. So we're moving to trying something called Orga P, which is a biosolid product from the city of Gatineau. And touch wood, it's been really promising. We put it on after the fall wheat comes off, uh, typically before the cover crop gets planted. But this year it was so dry, there was no cover crop. So... Right. So, and, and let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about um, all the different crops in your rotation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are right now standing in a field of buckwheat, which you don't see a lot of in Ontario for sure. Uh, so let's talk about all the different crops you've got lined up. And then, yes, yeah, some of the amendments and things that you are using, yeah. um, you know, to, to get that organic matter, get that carbon into the soil system. So we are seed producers, so we already have the luxury of having a diverse rotation. And the seed production really, it helps make, get the cereals into our rotation. So we do canola, which gives us a chance to get fall wheat in the ground and also has a really nice taproot structure. And so we do canola fall wheat followed typically by beans and then corn. And so then we'll go 
either with beans again or into canola again. But we really, because I'm a, I'm an agronomist, an integrated pest management is a very big part of what we do. We're very careful to have it so that we're not we're not loading things up to have issues. It's a very white prone air, white mold prone area for soybeans. So soybeans really pay when they work and there's nothing worse than having a terrible field die. So with the soil health, it, you got to kind of manage this because we suddenly start putting a bunch of manure on. Um, because we have a white mold prone area, we can set ourselves up for crop failure. So you want to be making sure that you're planning to anticipate for a lot of that. And the buckwheat is actually because I'm a beekeeper too. So it was my way of getting the girls. Um, it was a clean up. We bought a farm and it was an old pasture field full of lambs quarters. So it was one of those things. Well, well, let's try some buckwheat and see how that turns out. So it has yet to be combined. So we'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, keep us posted on how that goes. But of course, it does add a little diversity for all sorts of things, whether it's for the soil or for the bees or both. Um, t so you did mention the one soil amendment. What all have you tried um, to get some of that carbon into and, and different nutrient sources into rotation? So I'm always a big fan of anything you can produce on farm. So I love cover crops. And for people who don't have a big diversity, just anything growing is going to really help. But just like, what's the best food for you to eat to be healthy? Well, it's a trick question because it's actually a balanced diet. So I think we need to be, we're gonna be finding that for the flora and fungi, fungi in the soil, um, we need to be giving them a lot of different things. So the buckwheat, I'm actually really kind of keen to see how this, because this had been a pasture field, so there was a lot of hoof traffic, a lot of compaction. So I'm really interested in seeing how the buckwheat um, roots actually help make things better. And then for amendments, we were really keen to try some uh, compost from the city of Ottawa, but we are an hour's drive. We needed to have a non-agricultural source material. It's like okay. a nutrient management plan. So right. it takes a lot of extra effort. Now they, it had been paid for by the company, but they couldn't get the freight rate low enough because pretty well you're, you're sending packing peanuts, right? And then from a carbon footprint and just a logistics point of view, there's a lot of cropland closer to Ottawa that would probably benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So I'm keen to try it, but it just doesn't work for our distance. So for us, the big thing is going to be is cover crops. Um, we do bale our straw. Straw is a major part of our income, but we try to cut a little high so that we still have some issues. We actually have a lot of slug issues if we're not careful. So it's always a balance with when you do reduce tillage, managing that residue so you don't have to do tillage, but not to the point where you're actually going to have a legacy issue with slugs. We're trying to do what we can to minimize some of the insecticides on the, the crops that don't need it because... I think it's helping our ground beetle population, which is the primary predator of the slugs. How many years then have you been using the uh, biosolids? Only three. Okay, and, and what has the experience been so far? So this is the part where I have to fess up and this is the total soil health thing. It's like, well, life happened. So I had plans of how we were gonna do it. We were gonna do some repeat trials. And then the guy running the loader thought that was stupid and just spread it all where he wanted to, which is fine because you got to pick your battles, right? These guys are exhausted and they just thought it was stupid. And then the next year I'm like, okay, we're going to use the yield monitor. And then the yield monitor can't, like, tanked at the end of the season and we lost all our data. So all I have is anecdotal evidence. Uh, the one thing though is that we did have uh, Wheat Pete come up and he was looking at the profile of it. And when we had our soil health day here a few weeks ago, and he's just like, anybody who can't do the math on this, obviously can't do math because you're getting all your nutrients and you're getting some extra stuff. The difference here is, is that I would like to see the science. Like I'm, I'm big on, like I understand you have to have faith in cover crops. You have to have for the long term, but it's a lot easier to justify things to the banker, to your partners, or when you're in a year where you have to prioritize because there just aren't enough resources to go around. What are the priorities? So we're starting on the worst fields, seeing what we can do. And then this year we've got a few more trying again. I'm definitely seeing a lot more like anecdotally there's a lot more like vigor and growth the following year it's just how much of that is just nitrogen we have very high um, organic matter levels here and most of the time we can't get really good concrete evidence on sulfur or nitrogen because we've got so much mineralized nitrogen coming forth which I think is really the end goal here is that then we can ride out these droughts and ride these out all of these other issues that like split applying, we can't even really justify the extra cost. I do it from an environmental standpoint, but that's something I'd like to keep evaluating as well.
Mm -hmm. And what does your uh, soil testing regimen look like? Do you guys do a lot? Do you want to do more? I need to do more. I was once very religious at it and our jobs changed and now I don't have any. It's just all me. Uh, I know I can hire it out, but I really want to be doing some zone tillage or zo not zone tillage, sorry, some zone um, soil sampling. So every year after the wheat comes off, we do it. So any cereals, usually it's every three to four years. So I have a lot to do this fall. <laughs> You'll be very busy. Yes. Okay, Jen, thanks so much. Thank you very much.